Good evening, everybody. I am Dan Fiorino. I'm director of the Center for Environmental Policy at School of Public Affairs at American University, and welcome to the 2020 William K. Riley Environmental Leadership Awards Program. We are very pleased. This is the this is the eighth and the and getting into the ninth year, but this is the 2020 awards program since we weren't able to hold that last spring, but we decided to, to do it now. So um, this is year number eight. We will be holding the 2021 program in late May or sometime in June. So we'll keep people apprised of that. But for tonight, we're celebrating 2020. Uh, the School of Public Affairs and American University and of course the Center for Environmental Policy are very happy to present this program. We have enjoyed a very productive and enjoyable relationship with Bill Riley for almost a decade now. Bill demonstrates the qualities of leadership, character, and commitment that provide an outstanding example to our students. So a, a major theme of the Riley program is developing the next generation of environmental leaders as well as recognizing environmental leaders uh, today. So um, this evening we will hear remarks in a little while from, from Bill Riley himself. Um, we first will introduce the two scholarship winners from 2020. So the Riley scholarships are given each year to two students in the um, School of Public Affairs, Master of Public Administration and Master of Public Policy programs. And we recognize students based on outstanding academic records, a commitment to environmental careers and potential for future environmental leadership. So I first want to um, introduce our scholarship winners from last year. They are uh, Chris Douglas, who's a Master of Public Policy student and Cam Vayner Depew, who also is a Master's of Public Policy student. They now both are in their second year of the MPP program, and both are very interested in environmental and energy policy. So we wanted to introduce them and just let you hear a few things about them. So Chris, can you tell us a little bit about your interests and your program and, and what you'd like to do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm currently working for a nonprofit advocating for sustainable energy policies at the state and local level. And I'm hoping upon graduation to continue to work on issues related to energy policy at, uh, at the federal level. Great, yeah, I know you have a very strong interest in, in energy and clean energy. Cam, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so currently this semester, I'm working um, with Montgomery County in Maryland on their 2021 climate action plan. Um, but just in general, I really have an interest in air quality and greenhouse gas emission reductions. And I'm looking to um, be a college professor in the future and eventually get my PhD. So that's, that's my plan as of now. Excellent. Okay. Well, um, it, it's great to have you two uh, with us this evening. We were not able to recognize you last year, so a little belated, but congratulations to both of you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the program. And I know that you will fulfill the expectations of William K. Riley scholarship winners. You are um, the eighth group. So I think we're building a very nice um, community. So thanks for joining us tonight. Um, let me now move on and introduce Bill Riley. So uh, Bill may not need much of an introduction for this audience because I think a lot of people know him. <clears throat> um, he has served, of course, as the administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, president of the World Wildlife Fund, as leader of a global water investment fund, uh, co-chair of the Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill Commission for President Obama, uh, and a number of other important roles. He has been a good friend to American University for a decade now, and is the recipient of an honorary doctorate from American University. So um, very pleased to introduce our a good friend of American University and our center, Bill Riley. Bill? Thank you, Dan. In years past, uh, it would have been the custom for me and Frank and Monica to have a class along with you <laughs> among the students. And that's among the most satisfying 
parts of the award ceremony that I hope we can return to when we have a normal year. But let me just say that um, my contact is necessarily a little more attenuated with, uh, with the winners this year, but I have read both of their essays and I'm struck by what a great credit it is to the AU education and the public affairs, School of Public Affairs, the sophistication that they have brought to some of their big ideas. It, um, it, Cam has a, um, an exposition of future water shortages and the kind the numbers of people who will be affected by chronic water shortages and some of the consequences for that disproportionate pollution affecting minorities. And finally end, ends up in a, in a very convincing explanation of Earth's carrying capacity, something that World Wildlife Fund publishes about every couple of years. Essentially, I think most recently saying we're, we're overtaxing the planet by about two and a half times in terms of the resources we take out of it. And Chris, I uh, was very taken by your, by the sense of urgency and commitment that comes through your essay. I uh, did not know many of the things that are in that essay. For instance, that the decline of wildlife in the Netherlands has been 50% in the last 30 years. And this is a place that takes wildlife pretty seriously and has a generally good program for conservation. And the relationship between forest fragmentation and disease is a very cutting edge subject. And, uh, and I think you've got it absolutely right. It's, uh, it is the source of major virus of all sorts. At any rate, these are two very distinguished pieces of work. And I am so proud to have my name associated with yours. Congratulations. And um, I look forward to following your careers. The careers of your predecessors in these awards are very gratifying. People working at EPA or the Agriculture Department, non-governmental organizations, local government, state government. It, the contribution's been very broad. And um, let me just say how very much we are proud of you. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, a few weeks ago, we had a uh, really fun program where we brought some previous um, Riley Scholarship winners from earlier years and had a conversation. And um, part of that exercise was pulling together the series of essays that Bill referred to. So that's available on the Center for Environmental Policy website. So people may want to take a look at that. Uh, now I'd like to, I, I would like to introduce our two environmental leadership award winners for um, 2020. Um, so the scholarships recognize future environmental leaders. We also like to recognize current <laughs> environmental leaders. So let me do that. And then we're gonna have a conversation with Monica and Frank and with Bill. And we'll um, have some time for questions from the audience uh, a bit later. So um, you can put your questions in on the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. So first, uh, Monica Ellis. Monica is the chief executive officer of two important organizations, the Global Environmental Technology Foundation and the Global Water Challenge. Her focus with both of those organizations is bringing safe water to communities and families, to people who otherwise would not have access to it. Monica has organized a partnership of companies, foundations, and government agencies and raised some $200 million to support clean water programs. She's on the board of the US Water Partnership and on water and sustainability advisory boards at several universities, including Johns Hopkins, Ohio State, and the University of Michigan. Monica is a true leader in the area of global water. So congratulations, Monica, for your award. Frank Lloyd has been working on environmental and climate issues since the 1980s, uh, including service as the Undersecretary of State for Global Affairs under President Bill Clinton. Uh, Frank also served under three other presidents in various positions related to environmental, climate, transportation, and refugee issues. Uh, he led the German Marshall Fund for several years uh, and held a variety of positions in the private sector. 
Uh, Frank has also contributed to the environmental field as a member of the board of such organizations as the Environmental Defense Fund, Resources for the Future, the League of Conservation Voters, and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Frank has been a true leader on international environmental diplomacy and progress. So welcome, Frank, and congratulations. And uh, we'll move into a conversation. And Bill, you're invited to join in as well. So let's uh, start at the beginning, as they say. Um, Frank and Monica, uh, can you tell us what, what inspired you to get into the environmental field? Um, Frank, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got into this line of work? Yes, I'd be happy to do that. You know, I, I didn't start out as an environmentalist, as a young person. Um, I started out to be a lawyer in the most traditional and probably some people would say boring sense. Um, but I, I had a client who brought me to Washington and he was the head of the FAA uh, under President Kennedy. That tells you a little bit about my age, I think. And he was also the President Kennedy's advisor on international aviation. And he had a big staff at FAA, but he didn't have anybody for international aviation work. And so he knew me from my law firm. And so he said, come back to Washington. I did. And that was the first of several times. And I have to say, those were very gratifying times. And they were under both administrations. I, I spent um, more than nine or eight, nine or 10 months uh, in the Nixon administration, if you will, um, working for really uh, inspiring people, all of whom were Republicans. I'm a pretty solid Democrat. And it was very, it was very, very rewarding to see government work under very difficult circumstances. Uh, but then I left. I did a number of other jobs, and one of them was running a foundation, uh, the German Marshall Fund of the U.S. And we needed really top-notch uh, talent on our board, and we recruited Bill Riley to join that board. And uh, that was a good move. Uh, and it, it was not predictable totally, of course, but it was a good move. <laughs> and, um, but none of this was directly related to the environment until uh, uh, really one of the people that brought me into that was Bill, when he asked me to serve on the board of the uh, Center for Environmental Policy in Eastern Europe which we formed, or which the government formed soon after the fall of the wall. And that was a, an exciting period and, and a very rewarding one. But I didn't really get involved in the environment until a little later. I made a little money and I was out of a job at one point trying to figure out what to do next. And my wife, Dale, uh, came to me and said, you know, you're fiddling away a lot of time and money and little things, and you don't have any strategy to your philosophy, to your philanthropy, and you don't have any strategy what you're supposed to be doing with your time. Why don't you pick a subject matter and really get deeply involved? That seemed like good advice. Um, and the, the subject matter that appealed to me was the environment and for several reasons one it's pretty damn important but two um it means that the, the the difference between doing it well and doing it badly matters and three you have to deal with people you don't agree with or you're not going to get any place and that seemed to me to be the kind of thing I like to do. That's the kind of thing I, I did as a lawyer. And it seemed to me, that's the kind of thing I had done earlier in the, in, the, in the Department of State. And so I got involved with the environment. And I must say very important in that was, the, was Michael Oppenheimer, 
the scientist who now is at Princeton and was then at EDF, who explained to me, who first mentioned to me the word climate change. I'd never heard that before, and most people hadn't heard of that. And when he described that to me, it seemed to me that was that's big stuff. And if that is what's at stake, it's worth switching your interest and making that a primary part of your interest. And that's what I did. And then I got involved with the Environmental Defense Fund and ended up chairing that board and then the League of Conservation and ending chairing that board and, uh, and the resources for the future and chairing that board. So I just kept getting deeper and deeper. <laughs> but feeling better and better that I was spending my time on the right thing. Yeah, and then, and then you were hooked. Uh, once you I get hooked. Skilled, yeah, sort of, sort of a progression from applying your legal skills to a new area. And I guess we can thank uh, Dale for getting, <laughs> pushing you into the environmental arena. And, um, and you've had a very um, significant career since then. Monica, how, how did you get into your line of work? Sure. Well, I studied to be a journalist, so I really hadn't planned, like Frank, to be a environmentalist either, but I was always interested in the environment. So I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up uh, kind of on the banks, pretty much, of the Mississippi River, as I mentioned in our pre-interview. But my parents, I say, would say, had a big handle in it because they always had us surrounded with a little bit of land, a garden, um, animals, you know, they took us on epic road trips out west to see um, the bounty of nature, and I just loved it. So from there, I was kind of hooked, and that was always something that was this burning interest. Um, in my early 20s, I guess serendipity and a job offer brought me to D.C. for an opportunity to work on the environment at the national level at that time with the chief of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who had a very supreme interest in sustainability and all the things that engineers could do to make a more sustainable world. So you guys might remember Hank Hatch. So that's who I worked for in a strategic planning unit for the Corps. Excellent, thought, excellent man. I yeah. worked with him closely. Uh, he he uh, defied the stereotype. He really was wonderful. He definitely did. And so I didn't realize what a great opportunity. I mean, I loved the opportunity, but it, in hindsight, it really was a, a game changer for me. And it was really kind of a unique time for the environment. It was a big convergence of issues. And around 1991, Bill, you remember this well, a time of really great global engagement um, on sustainability and the buildup to the Rio Earth Summit, which was held in 1992, which I had the benefit to work on. And so that was all really inspiring. There was a lot of momentum and promise, and I had the opportunity to be a part of that movement. So that's kind of what lit the spark, mm -hmm. I would say. And then when I moved over to the foundation, I had met um, the chairman of the foundation, Tom Harvey, while I was working for General Hatch. And I was able to move my platform and interest on sustainability environment over to the foundation. And, you know, I'm just kind of naturally curious. Um, my work on the Earth Summit and led me to water initially, but it was focused more on transboundary waters. So um, as I started to, to unpack what I was really interested in, it always came back to water because it's very multifaceted. Um, it's such a critical pathway for economic development, for health, for women's empowerment. So I've really just stuck with water and environment for most of my career. I took a trip to Africa in the early 2000s that really lit a fire in me for the need for clean water access and what that brings to human dignity, what it brings to communities, and um, came back from that trip and uh, we set some goals around what we wanted to do uh, to help bring clean water access and sanitation access for all after that. And we've been very lucky to have this coalition of public and private partners supporting us in our journey and helping us reach the impact that we've been able to achieve. So that's kind of how it started. And I just, it's kind of a dream job for me because every day you're making an impact that is on someone's life that lasts forever. It, it impacts, you know, how they, the quality of their life. Um, and I think that water is just, it's a good place for me to, to, to masterclass, I guess. 
Yeah, it's certainly important. Yeah, as, as my friends at EPA say, water is life. It and, is. Um, yeah. It's completely true. Bill, while we're on the theme, you have a, I mean, you didn't start out in an environmental career. You you sort of got in it, I think, through the through land issues and planning issues, right? That's right. I, I got out of the Army and I, uh, I went to planning school for uh, three or four semesters and was very interested in international land use. I had written my law school thesis on land reform in Chile and then wrote about uh, French remodelment policies that had had a huge impact on making more efficient the uh, Napoleonic division of lands in France. That, uh, you know, when I got out of school and, and we talk about reasons for hope and optimism, encouragement. When I got out of school, the fear, the anxiety that was hanging over everybody interested in international development was whether or not there was going to be mass starvation in India and China. Mm -hmm. That's what the preoccupations were among those of us who were interested in international development. And one of the reasons I think to feel positive about the future is that those are not concerns that are nearly so immediate today. They've been managed to a degree that no one expected they would be. Um, the water issues that Monica is involved with, and I, I must say, I think Monica once got me to agree to spend a year as co-chair of the World the Water Commission, Global Water Challenge. And uh, what, it, what is it, about year 10 or 12 now? Uh, <laughs> at any rate, she's very persuasive. And it's done such really remarkable work and particularly on women's issues that I have, I have noted and followed. But the uh, impact of, of both of our winners today, Frank's, Frank's public policy impacts and on the institutions that he has directed and led really been fantastic. The uh, little story about General Hatch, uh, Monica, I was on the mall in 1990 on Earth Day with John Denver. And John Denver was singing and I was answering questions. My daughter was with me. And someone took a sharp shot at the Corps of Engineers. And I gave a rejoinder. I said, no, they're being fabulous. They're supporting no net loss of wetlands. They support the president and all sorts of environmental issues. And I didn't know it, but standing in the middle of the crowd in his running shorts and t-shirt was General Hatch. You, you may imagine that the relationships between EPA and CORE, which had already become quite good, were, were very solidified by that, uh, that relationship. But it was true. They, uh, they were very cooperative and uh, his leadership was, was notable. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I, I, I remember, Bill, once when we were um, having uh, a meeting with students and, and somebody asked you about your career and, and your general advice was have a plan, but, but be ready to depart from the plan and, and be ready to take advantage of opportunities. And I think that's a lesson that really almost all of our environmental leadership award winners have demonstrated. I think that's true. What did Mike Tyson say? Have a plan, but the first time you get punched in the nose, be prepared to drop <laughs> it. Uh, I, I think it applies to a number of fields. Yeah, definitely does. No, I didn't have I didn't have a plan. I um, I was invited to join the new Council on Environmental Quality. I was the third or fourth hire in the Nixon administration under Russell Train, and um, I remember not being so sure. They wanted me to write the National Land Use Policy Act and the regulations for environmental impact assessment, and I said, you know, as a lawyer, I'm an expert in breaking down zoning laws and planning restrictions that inhibit the uh, location for poor people. And I'll never forget this very sophisticated lawyer just looked down at me. He said, well, if you can do one, you can do the other. I mean, if you can, if you can break them down, you probably have a pretty good idea how to build them. And I, uh, I thought, well, he's, he's a smarter guy than I am. But at any rate, that started <laughs> things out. And um, I, I can't, I never looked back. It was, a, it was a field that was very rich in all sorts of interests I already had. But uh, of course, over the course of the, the years, and I happened to, I happened to be present for the environmental rally, which was began in Earth Day 1970, and um, it it just was a very exciting time to be alive. Mm -hmm. Great, um, Monica. I have a note here that said you helped bring clean water to nearly 10 million people in 77 countries. Um, how, how do you do that? And, and, and what are some of the challenges in 
bringing bringing clean, safe water to that many people? Well, first, we're able to do that with a whole network of partners. So first, I want to do a shout out to the GTF team and then all of our over 300 partners around the world that we work with. That's how we do it. But the, the main issues, Frank, that we're working on, I called you Frank, sorry, Dan, that we're working on are going to be around reliability, water quality, and affordability, primarily. And so the barriers to those things fall in a lot of different categories from poor or no infrastructure um, and finding the right technologies that will fit the community and that apply to the context within the community. We also are often dealing with um, the effects of urbanization on communities. So in Africa, you have a number of the fastest growing cities in the world and their frontline providers of water access, which are the utilities or the water service authorities are overrun. They don't have the capacity to maybe uh, fulfill their mandate. So part of the work that we do in overcoming barriers is helping them develop pro core business models um, to help fulfill their mandate, to offer consulting sometimes talent and skills that is picked out of the private sector to work with those utilities to, to help them meet their mandate. Um, climate obviously is a big barrier that we're seeing because the front lines of climate often manifest in terms of water, too much water or too little water. Uh, too much, we've just seen recently in the floods uh, in Mozambique and then about a year, a year and a half ago, we had drought in Cape Town. And so um, we're working with a lot of upstream providers in watersheds to help protect the source and assure more of a, an abundance of water for the cities and the secondary cities. And then uh, helping communities build their resilience through conservation and other measures. So those are, those are some of the, the barriers that we see. And there's a whole host of strategies and partners that we work with to overcome them. But water is such a hyper-local issue that it's mm -hmm. very important to be flexible and adaptable and to really listen and, and then apply your solutions and partners to the context that, that you meet. I would just add that Monica has mediated between uh, major corporations, Coca-Cola, Dow, others, and engaged them in the policy process and in support of uh, water for people in developing countries and very constructively designed programs that are inclusive, that are um, nonpartisan, that, uh, that basically address serious problems. So, you, I mean, you work in partnership with a lot of private companies. Can you just give a few other examples of partners that you work with, Monica, sure. who make a difference? Well, we work with development organizations. Um, and so the bringing together, often the role we play is that facilitation of helping the public and private sector work together. Some want to bring financial resources, some want to bring technical or other resources. And so we're helping bring that whole symphony together. And then the implementing partners would be those that have a specialty or a presence in the communities that we're trying to work. And so they're working right on the front lines, helping work with the village chiefs. They might be working with the women of the community, helping them build an enterprise because water is now available in their communities. So that's, that's kind of the constellation. You've got civil society, you have government, you have donors like the Coca-Cola company, Cargill, others, um, great partners that we've worked with who are looking for a social license to operate, but also want to be constructive contributors to the solution. Okay, yeah, you use that word, the, the social license to operate, and it's very important. That's right. Many companies. Um, Frank, can you, can you tell us more how, um, in your experience at the State Department, um, I mean, I've been told that you really sort of developed <laughs> and advanced the art of international environmental diplomacy. Can you tell, tell us a bit about how that happened and how, how your role in the State Department made um, international environmental work more significant? Well, the trick was to marry the skill that quite a few people in the state have, the skill of bringing together disparate views, uh, people that don't agree with each other and may not agree at the end, but are closer than they were before. And that's what 
diplomats are supposed to be able to do, and that's what quite a few of them did do. But the problem was that the feeling was that the environment was a kind of a, uh, a special item here on the side, and it wasn't central. It wasn't what real diplomats did. And so one of the things uh, I, I had to do besides negotiating specific agreements was to uh, establish in the department the principle that environmental diplomacy was real diplomacy. Real men did that. Real mm -hmm. women did that. Uh, it wasn't just a sideline. And it's so well put. So yeah. well put. It's so overdue yeah. at the time. And... Uh, and that, that largely worked. That largely worked. I mean, the very serious foreign service officers on the way up to the top, uh, like an assignment in an environmental role uh, in a way that they would have shunned before. So that was an important uh, development because, you know, you deal with countries that have different interests, or they may have different trade interests, they have different geographical interests, they have different political interests. But in the end, the environment is a possible tool to bring countries together, especially when you uh, get over the hump of uh, saying that the developed world got rich by burning a lot of fuels, and therefore the developing world needs not only not to do anything, but it needs to be compensated. That was the, that was the atmosphere in which we started. And that's very different today. And today we recognize the joint obligation and the joint possibilities. Yeah, I mean, when I read about the um, Brundtland Commission, which, um, well, Bill Rosas, I think was the US representative uh, in the 1980s, that north-south division uh, was a big deal. So you think that's there's more a sense of a commonality now among different kinds of countries at different stages of development? Yes, yes, I do. I think in the United States, we got off to a, um, a, a start that was not perfect, and that is the Kyoto Agreement um, uh, which basically said that the developing world did not have to take any action because they were developing, they were too poor. And that had consequences. Uh, one of the one was that it made the Kyoto Agreement absolutely unpassable uh, as a treaty in the United States, because I think the feeling was that that was just the wrong approach and you could never do, get that done. But so working uh, with the developing countries and with hardline uh, industrialized countries to find common ground where you each had interests that were the same, but the resources that were very different and problems that were very different, that was, that was that's all doable, but it, it, it requires a little bit of um, open-mindedness and it requires a little bit of experience and it requires an understanding of, of uh, some environmental issues that luckily I had because of my NGO work mm -hmm. and, and that uh, others did not have in the department. And, and Bill, I, I recall being at EPA when you were the administrator and you, you played a big role in really elevating um, the role of international issues at EPA. Can you can you tell me a little bit about what what was going on at the time and and how you approached that? You know, I was struck by by what Frank said. Uh, he served later, and it helped enormously to have a heavyweight in the State Department who took the issues as seriously as he did. But uh, with all due respect, an awful lot of his colleagues didn't. An awful lot of colleagues in my own. Uh, the Bush administration did not. They fit the category of, uh, you know, that's not really what real men do. The president thought the issues were important, and that, of course, made a big difference. And then we had a lot of credibility because the United States had led on the Montreal Protocol and, um, and then set an example with the Clean Air Act. 
that really gave us a platform for international impact and in cleaning up Eastern Europe and establishing the center that Frank referred to in Budapest and um, addressing a range of international conservation issues and, and wildlife protection and things of that sort. Some of them not in my purview, but I was always consulted on. So it was a very exciting time to be part of government. Government was very active, was looking for things to do. The president was open to taking encouragement, for example, integrating development and environment and in trade deals. And um, it, was, it was very like the period that uh, I had served in in the early 70s when the country was with us. And you know, we passed the Clean Air Act with something like 90 to 10 Senators, imagine legislation of that consequence passing today with that kind of support. But that's what we had. And we had presidential leadership. We had American leadership. I made the case last uh, couple of years in Germany that we really needed to succeed in a treaty like Paris, a nation state, a prominent country, an active, effective country. And it had to be Germany because it wasn't going to be France, Britain or the United States anymore. And I was very discouraged to hear that the sense in Germany among very high level people was, it was not Germany's moment because the populist movement is so strong. The hemorrhaging of the major political parties is underway and, uh, and scientists are uh, in disrepute. Uh, elites generally are thought to include scientists. So this is an area now that, that cries out for American leadership. And the country, and I think the world at large, is, is prepared to hear it. I co-chair with John Podesta a track two climate program for India. And it's, a, it's so clear that there is an edge and we're gonna to have to overcome it. We've been reminded on one of our calls that the Indians made some significant sacrifices to accommodate our objectives in Paris. And then we headed out the back door. So our leadership won't come to us as readily as it might have, but it will come to us. And I think, I think much of the world is impatient for us to lead again. I think that would be welcomed. <laughs> um, Monica, in our um, pre-program conversation, um, the, the topic of women and the kind of work you do, can, can you tell us more about sort of the role of, of women in your work, uh, in the countries you work in and relationship to both what women contribute, but also how women are affected by the kind of programs you do in water. Sure, absolutely. Um, I think that what we see is that most of our programs in the clean water space that are implemented by women have longer and better outcomes. That was kind of a finding over this decade of investment that we've made. So with USAID, with the Coca-Cola Foundation, we commissioned a study called the Ripple Effect. We can post it in the, in the chat or send it out afterwards. But basically what it showed was the different pathways that become available to women once water is present, present excuse me, in a community. And it's everything from improved health, greater economic uh, return, um, higher incomes, um, safety, security, and then different agency and status within the community. And so what we see in our work is that water, while it's important to the entire community, women reinvest 90% of their incomes back into the community. So when you focus on women and water and that nexus, you really see a multiplier effect for the community itself. And what we've tried to do is to take that research and build campaigns around it educate donors about it so that we can uh, bring more clean water access to women in their communities. And that's what we're focused on. That's kind of the next chapter. Also working here uh, domestically for the nearly 2 million people in the United States who don't have clean water access and the 44 million who don't have access to quality water to drink. So those are our two pivots uh, for the next decade. Yeah, so a lot done, but a lot yet to do. Yeah, definitely. We're getting some interesting questions from our audience. So let me start one and whoever would like to respond. How do we assure that the current momentum within the Biden administration on climate change policy converts into climate action? Um, I mean, there what is- What do you think, Frank? <laughs> Go ahead, Frank. <laughs> well, uh, the first thing I'd say is pray 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then vote. <laughs> and then vote. <laughs> and then vote. Uh, and this, the, the, pre the present situation is, is, is quite sad and quite serious. Uh, the, um, at the moment, the kind of uh, spirit that uh, existed uh, when Bill was talking, when Bill was involved, uh, in the time of uh, Russ Train and the like, that, that simply doesn't exist at the moment. And uh, there is no magic, and I don't, think the, I, I don't think the environment has a lot of strength in fixing it, but if there is an issue, if there's an issue in which I think we can we make a breakthrough, it is in the, uh, in the jobs and equality program of a, of, a, of a climate program, uh, because I think from a pure political point of view, both parties need to need to support that. And so uh, I, they, I don't have any evidence to show that this is going to work, but it seems to me when you think about the, the issues that could unite a, 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 a program of major uh, support for low level jobs i mean jobs in cities and, and farms that that are related to the environmental program i think that has a chance optimism is another question yeah now i was on a program yesterday with Jigger shaw who's responsible for the uh, 40 billion dollars of energy investments that uh, are planned and i asked him the question because he, he said, if, if in four years we've not figured out how to cause the people who uh, invaded the capital to think that they have a stake in all of this and that things are going to get better, we will have failed. And I asked him, and do you see the opportunity in the investments you will make, both to address the climate crisis, but also the jobs crisis? In the town where I grew up, Decatur, Illinois, which uh, has lost Port Warner and Caterpillar and Bridgestone mm -hmm. Fire and Sire Tire, and it just uh, is an economy that has wilted away. And, and it basically, well, it didn't wilt away. It went to a lot of it went to China with full understanding that was happening at the time and acceptance, but without appreciation for the consequences. But there are awarenesses of those matters in this administration. And that's tremendously exciting. And Frank's right that there ought to be a uh, coming together on the reindustrialization of, of, of mm -hmm. a new economy, a greener economy that does in fact bring people together and give them, give them permanent and uh, incredible and effective jobs. Yeah, it's a little crazy in getting ready for this um, panel. I was thinking about how long has it been since we've had kind of a presidential focus on sustainable development? So, you know, and you guys remember the President's Council on Sustainable Development, that charter expired about 22 years ago. We've seen nothing like it since in any okay. administration, Democratic or Republican. And I was just pulling up the charter because our foundation did a lot of work with them and big focus on jobs. We need to dust some of that stuff off. There's some very, very good aspirations and goals. You'll remember it was chaired by two corporate leaders. Yeah. Um, it, it was ahead of its time. And I think what I was reflecting on is, man, I really was very lucky to come in at the time that I did to sustainability. Because if you came in now, or you came in maybe over the last four years, particularly, I think you'd be a little discouraged. So now's the time to be encouraged again. And we have the opportunity to pick up on some of those good ideas. I think that there's a there's a receptivity to, to some big things in the culture and in the country that uh, is belied by the fact that there hasn't been any bipartisanship to speak of yet. But but we may see it in infrastructure. That's been an area that looked like it should have. But I just want to say something. I was reminded of the Mike Tyson point that um, some years ago when there were lines around the block around every gas station and gas stations were running out of fuel to the Arab oil embargo. It was a real calamity economically and in so many other ways, confidence in the country. I happened to find myself on a shuttle flight to 
New York, sitting next to Thomas Corcoran, Tommy the Cork, oh, the one Cork. of the two great authors of the New Deal, a lot of the New Deal programs. And so he was then in his 80s. And I said, uh, I had known his daughter. And uh, so he knew the family. And I said to him, uh, what would Roosevelt do? How would Roosevelt deal with this crisis? And he immediately lost about 20 years of his age. And he said, I know exactly what he would do. He would call us all in and he'd chew on his uh, cigarette holder and he would say, boys, somebody's got to go over the side. It's pretty clear who it is. It's the energy secretary, Schlesinger. So I said, okay, so then what? Well, he said he'd let two or three weeks go by. He'd call us all again and just as ebullient, just as confident, lean back in his chair with a cigarette holder in his mouth and say, boys, what do we do now? <laughs> and I said, it was really that spontaneous. He said, it really was. He said, the mood was just try something, try it, see how it goes. And I'm reminded as we see these trillion dollar proposals that's what's going on now. That's when the country often can do its most creative work. We, we don't expect, they didn't expect everything's gonna work, but um, a lot did. And you know, I think a lot will now. I am a little bit uh, encouraged. I'm encouraged by the kind of uh, thinking that the bill just exhibited, but also by the fact that in other industrialized countries that have very conservative and very progressive parties and a whole a range of parties that the, the kind of sharp division on political grounds on an issue like climate doesn't exist as it does in this country. Mm -hmm. And I think I like to think that ours at the moment is somewhat captured maybe by one person and that that makes it hard to undo. But I, it is so illogical that that uh, that issue divides us in the way it has, that I don't, I just have some faith that it's not going to stay. You know, both of you are exemplars, however, of an enormous success in international development. The country doesn't really understand. I remember explaining that once to President Obama. I said, it, I'm amazed at the Global Development Council to see the reduction in childhood mortality and in, in malaria and, and measles and polio. And I mean, it goes on and on. These are remarkably important achievements. And your fields, both of you made major contributions in these fields. And uh, the, to the extent that we understand what has been achieved and by private sector, the Gates Foundation, AID and, 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 uh, and other governments, I think it's a source of hope and optimism. We have done something very big in the recent past, and it had enormous consequences for the health and well being of so many people the world over. We're continuing to do it, and I think, uh, I think we can do it in other spheres as well. Well, you know, uh, that's a very in interesting point. I I chaired for a long time the board of something called Population Services International, which is a big organization, very big international organization on, that does principally family planning in developing countries. We were able to maintain our fund, and the United States government is a significant, is a very large donor to that organization as our other governments. We were able to maintain that funding during a number of Republican administrations uh, because the logic was so overwhelming that as long as we didn't have a lot of publicity, they were kind of satisfied that we could go ahead. And you can imagine that happening here. We have an interesting question um, from, from a friend of mine at EPA. Um, EPA has a primarily domestic mission beyond technical support. What are the possible roles you envision EPA can play in international climate? And I'll add international water policy. So, so what, what can EPA contribute to solving these sorts of international problems given its authorities and, and position in the government? Well, you know, uh, 
I started the new system administrator for international at uh, EPA and was struck by the degree of prestige that the agency carried, almost inversely proportional to Washington's distance, but enormous respect because of our epidemiology, because of our automobile lab, our water labs, and the range of resources we had, and the regulatory powers that we exercised. So EPA has enormous capability, and I, I remember wishing that uh, it was not uh, that it would remain responsible for border health and relations after the North American Free Trade Agreement went through and new administration came to power because there was so much substantially we could do. And I, I think one of the best illustrations was, uh, was Secretary Baker, Secretary of State, coming to me and saying, I don't know what you're doing with the Chinese. This was after Tiananmen Square and the rest of it. We weren't allowed to go there. But he said, whatever it is, they love you. Keep it up. And I said, well, I'll tell you that what we can do that you can't at the State Department is uh, we send engineers to solve problems of cement kiln dust uh, suppression and methane recapture and very fundamental um, technical problems. Well, EPA has that capability and to the extent it does not involve itself in the kind of issues that the State Department has to, it, it has, has some advantages that, that the international agencies don't have. So I think it, it's an underutilized resource I might say also is probably the single most inspiring um, experience that an EPA professional can have to discover that the kind of problems that, that uh, other countries are facing uh, exceed orders of magnitude, the seriousness, the health consequences, and the fixability often that, of the problems that we address here at home. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, one of the things that we've worked with EPA on in the early days of the foundation, we actually did a clean water circuit rider program in Kazakhstan with the International Office of EPA, uh, which was certainly ahead of its time and helped set up that, that system. Um, what you said about the professional relationships and camaraderie is true, and I've seen that firsthand, and then that those relationships last to tackle other challenges sometimes when diplomacy is appropriate. Um, EPA is one of the agencies that can work in China, which is very nice, um, USA doesn't. And the other thing that we've seen um, through our clean water work in Africa is that lab capacity and the technical capacity of EPA has been phenomenal in helping. There are many countries in Africa that, that cannot test for the water quality contaminants uh, that we need to test for. They just, they don't have the capacity and EPA has been helpful in advising and helping build that capacity with us. So I think that there a, there's a greater and higher purpose that the EPA could play on a national and international stage that would benefit everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, lots, lot to contribute. We also had a question that uh, I like this. Um, what advice would each of you give to uh, the new EPA administrator, Michael Regan? If you, if you, if you had a chance to give him <clears throat> one piece of advice, what, what would you emphasize? Bill, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you since you were there. <laughs> well, he started very well. Essentially, he's got a job of uh, dealing with a demoralized agency in a place that has been severely buffeted by the abandonment of principles that underlie our history from the beginning and the statutes that we administered, basically science. And the Science Advisory Board, before I even got into office, I asked them to tell me what are the major threats to the environment and the health of the people of the United States, and to what degree does my budget correspond to your sense of those priorities. Well, that guided us through all sorts of budget requests and research and and uh, communications to the Congress, and it, the template was science. And these were the very best scientists. Well, the administration got rid of the Science Advisory Board and then created obstacles to scientists who had worked for EPA or with EPA to having those positions in future. But that's a lot to dig out from under. So there's got to be a whole complement, a new 
a new selection of people to play those roles. And uh, as the administrator has elected to do, and he's been criticized for this, um, he's, he's got to go back and look very closely at any number of decisions where cost benefits now is uh, questioned, where the methodologies were changed in order to uh, uh, achieve a result more favorable to development and economics. The, the overwhelming proportion of decisions where the economic justification, the reduction in cost to the regu people regulated was emphasized to, to the exclusion of anything related to the environment. That uh, was unashamed. And all of those things will take time, especially where you're redoing a regulation that requires hearings, public consultation, review, response to the review and so forth. We're talking about a couple of years of time just to undo a number of things that unfortunately have to be revisited. So that's what he's, he's doing. And I think he's making it very clear to the agency that uh, there's, a, there's a new philosophy now. It's a familiar philosophy. It's one that stood us very well. It's a philosophy of transparency and respect for science. And we need to find it again. Excellent. Well, I would, uh, I would uh, tell him that uh, it is possible to view the business community, including the business community in some sensitive industries as a potential ally in making progress. Uh, and that uh, much of that community is way ahead of where the last administration was. And I, I, I see that I, I, I serve on an external panel for ExxonMobil on its social responsibility or agenda. And you know, ExxonMobil is the, the company that environmentalists love to hate. And the, the past is not entirely satisfactory. It's quite bad. But even in an organization like that, there is substantial change in, in the right direction. And I think an EPA administrator who captures as much of that as possible will go a lot farther than one who doesn't. Well said. Nice. Yeah. Monica, what advice would you offer? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we always try to work the issues, not the politics, but I would point out that there is a wonderful opportunity for EPA to reach out to those pockets of people, 44 million and growing, um, who lack the water quality that they need to have healthy lives. That's an important political block. You have a lot of those people are in the same 70 million people that, that support perhaps our, our former president in some cases and showing a caring and an aptitude and a focus on something that's so important to your everyday life, I think brings a very realistic perspective and caring that we would like to see from, from this administration. So focus on, on clean water and water quality. Mm -hmm. as a priority. And there's an opportunity with the infrastructure legislation as well. That's, that's yeah, I mean, the infrastructure plan has lots of implications for, for water policy and water issues, correct? Yeah. Right. Um, another question on um, environmental technologies. In the context of the growing likelihood of not achieving targets for mitigating, mitigating climate change at the time frame required, what are your feelings towards attempts to geoengineer the climate? That is uh, solar radiation management, similar kinds of options. Should the US government start investing real resources toward these nascent, nascent te technologies? So geoengineering, which is always a challenging topic. Any, any but there is one there is one kind of geoengineering that, that I think has to have our support, and that's the extraction of carbon dioxide from the air. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a technology that um, it exists at this time. It's uh, highly expensive, and how you sequester where you put it is a question. But the extraordinary thing to me is how little we have focused on nature 
and nature's capacity to address some of these problems, most specifically with respect to the oceans, to mangroves and to uh, seaweed farming. Some of these things are coming on and it turns out that the, the magnitude of sequestration possibility relatively passively has not ever been understood. And um, tell me like 30% of the CO2 is all that always generate, been generated over time is in the oceans. And there's a possibility of retaining more of it there, depending on how we plan some of these and, and creating some new industries as well. Um, I, I'm very taken also by the new wood construction that is coming out of Europe, particularly France, that um, allows you to build up to seven stories, as I understand it, with essentially wood replacing concrete and steel. Uh, those are the latter two are both very consumptive of um, of clean air and uh, and generating of CO two. So this, this these are technologies that could really transform construction in very positive ways. And we're gonna duplicate the number of buildings we have now over the next 25 to 30 years. So there's another opportunity. I have a feeling that technology can address any number of these issues. I don't think it's a, it, it, it's a single bullet solution, but uh, I think that the horizon is full of such opportunities if we can, if we can marshal them. Yeah, I, uh, Bill is right. Uh, I think we have to we have to go to the long shot of direct air capture, which is I think, which we don't know how to do at 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 a, at a, at a cost that cost that we can afford. But it is my sense is we're missing our targets of reduction of CO two emissions as we go on. So that's very likely something we will want. Intermediate to that, however, is a, a, a carbon capture uh, possibility, which exists and which we know how to do and which is much closer in terms of being economically feasible. And there, I think we have to help industry uh, capture the carbon that comes out of a smokestack and do something positive with it. And we know how to do that when we're doing it in a very small fashion, but we need to get, get the cost of that down. And I think the beauty of that has, is again political in part because it, it, provides a, uh, it provides a lifeline for gas and oil that you can't eliminate otherwise. And uh, of course, that's why a lot of environmental communities are hostile to carbon capture and use because it does that. But I say, let's be realistic. We're not getting rid of all fossil fuels in our lifetime or in the lifetime of a lot of younger people. So we've got to find a way to address the smoke that comes out of the chimneys of plants that use carbon, that use uh, fossil fuels. And, and, and you get political support for that. You get Senator Barrasso of Wyoming supporting uh, uh, basically something that the clean air people want. Yeah. Because he's saving the life of coal in his opinion. <clears throat> Monica, do you have any um, observations on any of these uh, ca capture removal geoengineering issues? Just building on what Bill said, you know, we're supporting efforts in natural, nature-based, blue carbon, so ocean-centric solutions um, that offer an opportunity for livelihoods, for food security, for sequestration. And we're in the process right now of working with um, Professor Carlos Duarte, Alexander Cousteau, others on um, what the potential for that sequestration is, and then a plan for afforestation using seaweed in the, in the ocean. Um, so that's one of the ones that we've been looking at, but I think that, that the natural solutions offer a lot of promise for scale. They've been unexplored because often they're happening, they're not happening here. And it's very hard to grow seaweed, for example, outside of the United States because of permitting issues, but that's getting easier, so. Um, we should check back on just this topic in about six months when the study that we're working on is done 
and um, we'll be happy to share what we think the potential is for those natural solutions. Excellent. Well, you share it with us and we'll share it with our audience. So look Please. forward to that. Yes. Um, one more audience question, then I just have a, a wrap up question for for everybody. But um, <laughs> I like the way this is written, not quite ready to retire yet and still putting kids through college. Despite these distractions, what are some of the ways that the average working person can get involved in supporting climate and I'll add water issues. So what what can regular people do to contribute to solving these kinds of issues? Hey, I'll give you I'll give you a practical example that I've got challenge. Um, I have a farm in central Illinois, a grain farm. And um, my wife is uh, very unhappy that glyphosate is part of the as it is for everybody in Midwest, part of the solution to manage a pest there. But the need to reconsider how to regenerate soils and how to conserve them, how to reduce the amount of uh, chemical deposits when, they, when you place them on the crops and so forth, it all needs to be rethought. And I, I deal with a fabulous farmer and um, people tell me, why don't you just tell him how to do everything different? Well, uh, if I could tell him how I, he will increase his yield, uh, he'll be all ears. But I, uh, I know that community and uh, you got to have something to sell. At any rate, I'm impressed that uh, there was a time when the conservation services of the agriculture department took such problems very seriously. And this secretary, Vilsack, has said that he intends to try to reestablish the capability of looking anew at, uh, at agricultural practices, which themselves are something like 30% of the CO2 that, that we're addressing. So this is, this is not an idle issue, not a small issue. I mean, it, it possibly affects in the near term, small number of the part of the economy, but it's, it's usually consequential for the environment over time and for the sustainability of the soils and the, and the productivity of them. So, um, I mean, I, I offer that, I don't have an answer, but I'm talking to people who, who believe they do. And, um, and now it's, it's really on my plate because my, uh, I'm, I'm doubling the size of my property. My sister died just a couple of months ago. And so I'm now going to work on her part as well. Well, I mean, that, actually, that's a great answer because it says, you know, make, make it part of your business. Um, you're, you're working people and, and, and make environment part of your work, which to me is if you don't connect environment, energy, sustainability with how you live your life and how, how the economy works and how you do business, um, we're not going to really get there. And I mentioned it, it's not easy to do. I don't uh, just stand yeah. here to say I've got the answers, I've, but I'm hoping to get some. Yeah. Okay. And Frank, what advice would you give for what, what regular people can do to help solve these problems? I think um, um, starting with Monica, go ahead, please. Oh, thanks, Frank. Sorry. Starting within your own environmental footprint, your consumer choices, your mm -hmm. information technology, your social media, that kind of thing, that's a good way to start and just supporting it and making good choices and buyer behavior um, is, mm -hmm. is one. Um, and then on the water side, you know, within the U.S., just becoming more aware of, one, those without access within the United States, if we're talking about a domestic consumer, there are a number of good uh, organizations that you can support to help bring clean water access, both here in the U.S. and then internationally. Our Women for Water campaign is one of them, Global Water Challenge, others. Um, I think just understanding your own footprint, though, is where it all starts, and then making change from there. Okay. Frank? Well, I, what can you do? I think I would start with the, the politics of climate and the politics of water, for that matter. That is, I think the kinds of decisions we need to make as a country are going to only be made if there is a larger group of Americans that push for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means, and, and that's tough at the moment because of what we said earlier, that is that this issue has become a 
kind of a very partisan issue. And it all of a sudden it's connected with gun rights and it's connected with all kinds of liberal versus versus conservative issues. And then what you ought to try to do is to separate that from those issues on the theory that there is enough common interest that, that really ought to hold together different parts of our society. And I think working through your churches and your, and your civic organizations and, and your businesses to achieve a, a, a politics that puts the climate issue as high as it ought to be is what anybody can do, some people more than others, but everybody can participate in that. You know, that, that is really important, Frank. I, I took the, the papal encyclical around to a number of pastors and I said, how come uh, this has had the highest priority in the, in the church papal statement? And yet I never hear about it. And three of them gave me the same answer. They say, you know, if you mention climate, environment or immigration from the pulpit, half the congregations looking at you thinking, oh, he's one of those guys. And so instead of it being a source of peace and serenity, it becomes divisive. Well, somehow there's something that parishioners can address themselves, I think, and change the conversation so that there is an understanding that um, these resources, the church traditions have them as sacred. And, and, yet, and yet the failure to explicitly address them, even, even where the record is exemplary as it is for the church on immigration, say um, the ability to, to do what the church did during the, well, during the 60s, where uh, there was a lot of courage demonstrated and, um, and people spoke out. University presidents spoke out in a way that they don't now. But I, I think creating the reminding people of the moral dimension of this issue and its religious roots to those to whom that matters, I think your point is exactly right. Well, thank you for those thoughts. We're, we're um, about to wrap up, but can you, we had one last question. Um, and if you could just give your 20 second answer, what, what gives you hope for the future? Monica, what gives you hope for the future? Sure, my kids, of course, give me hope for the future. <laughs> and I see how well equipped and ready, they're well informed, well equipped with their technology, well informed and ready mm -hmm. to fight and be warriors for social justice, for the environment, for equity, equal rights. That's what gives me hope for the future. Excellent, Frank? That's very similar to Monica, except in my grandkids, uh, in my case. Uh, but I think, uh, I think there are parts of our society, and they're mostly in the young parts, that get this issue yeah. as a, the kind of moral imperative that Bill was talking about, uh, and that, uh, that need to become even more active and more vocal on it. But they're there, and that, that is likely to be our savior. Bill, a last word? Well, you know, I, I prefer to the successes that the world, America, uh, people have had on international development and health in the, in the recent past. And those are so important and so encouraging. But beyond that, I mean, you take an issue like the environment and the condition the country was in in 1970 and how extraordinarily ambitious it was for those who drafted the statutes and mobilized the, the people and the, the taxpayers who paid the money and the industry who complied and did things that uh, when we started out, they didn't even know how they were gonna do, such as automobiles and catalytic converters and the rest. Um, I think there's every reason if you are active in the environment to realize that you're part of a, a winning movement. And off and on over 50 years, it's been decisively effective and impactful. And there's no reason that we can't do it again to the extent the country gets it. And, um, and we set our minds to it. And on those positive notes, we will conclude. Um, congratulations again.
Monica, and Frank. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you as always, Bill Riley, for joining us for this event. Just wanna close by telling you about a couple of um, programs we have coming up. Next, um, next Wednesday, April 21st at three o'clock, we'll have a showing of the film that produced by the Center for Environmental Filmmaking at American University with our cooperation and that of the American Lung Association, Unbreathable, The Fight for Healthy Air, which includes um, interview segments with Bill Riley. Uh, on April 22nd, um, another of our series on pathways to a decarbonized economy and a more livable planet on the cost of climate mitigation and the co cost of falling short. And then um, on April 29th in the afternoon, the Center for Environmental Policy will um, hold a conversation with Savvy Horn of the Land Loss Prevention Project. Um, registration for that will be opening soon, so we'll get information out about that. That is actually um, part of the Riley program for this year. So it's a in, in, in lieu of our normal keynote, we're having a discussion with Savvy Horn. So thank you to everybody for joining us. Thanks for everybody for participating. And uh, we hope to see you at future events. So good evening. Thanks to you, Dan. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.